1957, the British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan told the British public that they'd never had it so good. His words became an instant meme, if memes had existed back then, and grabbed everybody's attention with their optimism and seeming positivity. But was it true? And most importantly, was it true for the food of the 1950s? Join me as I find out today on The Past is a Farm Pantry. The 1950s conjures up a golden age. Glorious summers, glamorous housewives, smoking before smoking was bad for you. But at the start of the 50s, rationing was still very much in force and didn't end entirely until 1954. At the start of the 1950s, most households still had a cold slab in their kitchen which they would put on their milk and their butters. They didn't have a fridge. By 1959, that had switched for the first time in history when most households did end up with a fridge as opposed to a cold slab. So this decade is a decade of two halves. At the start, really quite austere, still reeling from the effects of World War II, and by the end, looking forward with hope to a bright new future. And with this bright new future came changes to the way that we eat. And a lot of these changes came from America. As well as technological advances like the refrigerator, people were listening to new types of American music. And when the king of rock and roll swung his hips onto the music scene, teenagers across the country went mad. More traditional people were quite scandalised by Elvis's gyrating, but it kind of heralded the way for a new start and a new era, and the rise of the teenager really became a thing during this decade. To capitalise on this newfound appreciation of American culture in Britain, the fast food chain Wimpy founded a branch in Lyons Tea House in London in 1954, where people could go to buy something called a hamburger and it would be served with chunky chips not fries and silver knife and fork so that you could eat it properly not with your hands and as well as fast food convenience food was also having a bit of a boom america created the tv dinner in 1954 and it sold millions throughout the country they then exported that idea to britain and in 1955 the fish finger arrived which obviously became a staple of households we still eat them i still feed them to my child today but despite this there were some things that still were quintessentially British. 1953, Elizabeth II was crowned Queen of England. Millions of people around the country crammed themselves into their neighbour's room around a rented, bought TV if their neighbour was lucky enough to be able to do that, to watch her coronation live as it happened. Street parties lined England. There was cake under every table, children waved flags, fireworks were let off. It was a national celebration. And what dish could sum up the coronation of the Queen better than coronation chicken? Now, coronation chicken today is seen as a slightly unimpressive, kind of disappointing, ready-made sandwich filling. It's not something that you would necessarily make for people if you were coming around. It's not necessarily even a sandwich filling that a lot of people would pick to eat. It's quite sweet, it's filled with kind of sultanas and um, quite an alarming orangey yellow colour um, and is usually found in sort of stodgy, like I said, sandwiches at the back of convenience fridges in supermarkets. So it's not really something that I would imagine a queen wanting to eat and it's not something that I would see as a great celebration of a coronation. It's certainly not seen as grand. Having said that, I do actually quite like coronation chicken. Just, I just want to get that out there in case people disagree quite angrily about this. I know people feel strongly about sandwich fillings. I do like it. But the original recipe for coronation chicken wasn't destined for a sandwich. It was published by Constance Spry in the Constance Spry Cookery Book, which came out in 1956. Called on Bleu Trained, she and her co-author Rosemary Hume had an instant hit on their hands with the Constance Spry Cookery Book. Constant Spry was already known for sort of flower arranging, but with the Constant Spry cookery book, she went on to sell millions and millions of copies to cooks who appreciated the elegance she brought with it, this cordon bleu trained chef, who taught them how to be very, very elegant and fashionable in the kitchen, but also was supremely practical about it as well. So her book runs to over a thousand pages. It's a really, really hefty work, but it includes things as simple as how to carve out a grapefruit, 
and then as things as complex as how to spin sugar and how to throw a very very elegant dinner party and, and how to lay out your table so she's really covering all of the bases of home cooking and quite sweetly, in her foreword, she acknowledges and thanks past English cooks. Hannah Glass from the 18th century and Sir Kenel Digby, who was a Tudor author, um, and she says that they've written so beautifully that they have paved the way, and them and others, that they have paved the way for modern day chefs to be able to write as beautifully and as elegantly as they have. And as somebody who has used both Hannah Glass's and Kenelm Digby recipes before, yes, they write beautifully, no, they're not using quantities, which is really infuriating, but I can really appreciate what Constance Bry is doing. So, back to Harold Macmillan then. You've never had it so good. His words have often been taken out of context, and rather than um, chastising people, he's kind of warning them, don't get complacent. He was worried. We've never had it so good. It can only go downhill from now. So even though he was worried that the golden age of the 50s was gonna ultimately come to an end in quite a bad way, all I can do as I embark on my experiment today is hope that at least the food of the 50s isn't disappointing and really is a golden age of cooking. Wish me luck and hope you enjoy the 1950s. To make mint ice you will need 450 mils or three quarters of a pint of water, 110 grams or four ounces of sugar, a handful of mint leaves, the rind and juice of two lemons, green food colouring, one pink grapefruit. Put the water into a pan and bring to a boil. Add the grated rinds of the lemon along with the sugar. Heat until boiling for five minutes, then add mint, turn off the heat, add the lemon juice and leave to infuse for 10 minutes. Strain and leave to cool. When cool, add a little green food colouring and freeze. When ready to serve, cut a grapefruit in half. You will need half a grapefruit per person. Hollow it out, then sprinkle the inside with sugar. Spoon the frozen mint ice into it and top with mint and serve. Here we go. Constant Sprite says that this is perfect for a summer starter, which is perfect because although you wouldn't know it, what with the drizzle and the downpours we've been having, this is meant to be our summer. So, couldn't have picked a better time to make this. I have to say, I have to say there's something very charming about how it looks. It's like, it's very, very kind of campy, kitschy almost, maybe. I don't know if I'm using that word right. Somebody told me that I didn't use it right a while ago, but I haven't changed how I use it, so I'm probably using it wrong. But you know, this, yellow skin and then this bright lurid green especially when it was in the pot so i think it's quite charming actually i quite like it anyway let's see what it tastes like cold <laughs> oh my gosh i really like this oh i really like that it's not it doesn't feel like a starter to me because it's very sweet it is basically it's flavoured ice, isn't it? But it's so refreshing. It's it's minty, but not uh, medicinal. So it's quite sweet mint and quite citricky. Like a, you can taste the lemon. And then I think, I don't know if it's, a, yeah, it is the grapefruit. I don't know if that's intentional or if I didn't squeeze the grapefruit out enough, but you've got a slightly bitter aftertaste because of the grapefruit, but it's absolutely delicious. It's so refreshing. I absolutely understand why she said this is perfect for summer because it's, it's it is it's very 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 cooling um and i guess it would cleanse your palate although if you're having it first i don't know what you're cleansing your palate off but it would cleanse your palate before your main course and wouldn't really fill you up very much because it is just ice um so that you would have lots of space i guess for your next dish but this is very very delicious not what I was expecting, not savoury, but absolutely brilliant. Anyway, let's hope that the main course is as delicious as this. To make coronation chicken, you will need three or four chicken breasts, a wine glass of red wine, a wine glass of white wine, a tablespoon of oil, any kind will do, a pinch of sugar, a dessert spoon of curry powder, salt and pepper, one carrot, 
two to three tablespoons of whipping cream, one lemon, one to two tablespoons of apricot puree or compote, 450 ml or three quarters of a pint of mayonnaise, thyme, rosemary, two bay leaves, a teaspoon of tomato puree, one onion, three or four peppercorns. Chop the carrot and put it in a pan with the chicken, thyme, rosemary, one of the bay leaves, the peppercorns and some salt. Cover with the white wine and some water. Poach for 20 to 30 minutes. Begin on the sauce by chopping the onion finely and frying it in oil. After two or three minutes, add the curry powder and fry for a few more minutes. Add the tomato puree, red wine, three quarters of a wine glass of water, bay leaf, and bring to the boil. Then turn the heat down and simmer for five to 10 minutes. Chop the lemon into two slices and add these, along with the juice of half a lemon. Add sugar and salt to taste and strain through a sieve. Add the apricot puree and mayonnaise and whisk to combine. Whisk the cream until lightly whipped and then fold two tablespoons or three tablespoons into the sauce. Taste for your preference and add any more salt, sugar or lemon juice if you feel it needs it. Remove the chicken and slice into pieces. You can coat each piece in sauce or drizzle the sauce over the top. Serve it with rice. Okay, so coronation chicken. The sauce is a little thinner than I would be used to because I've only ever seen coronation chicken as a sandwich filler, which is obviously thicker. And it does look the colour of coronation chicken, but it obviously lacks sultanas, which is something that modern coronation chicken has in it. So I'm interested to see how this recipe differs from modern. First things first, it's not as sweet. Modern coronation chicken is definitely much sweeter. And this 1950s version is a lot more sour than modern, which was is surprising. Well, no, is it surprising? I don't know. It's not as creamy, and I don't think it's as indulgent as modern coronation chicken is. I don't know why, I don't know why that is, because it's got mayonnaise and it's got cream in it, but maybe it's just changed so much from the 50s to today that it's actually not really the same thing that we eat in a sandwich compared to what this is, clearly. This would have been served with a rice salad which had cucumbers and herbs and things in which again is quite a light accompaniment if you compare to bread and butter which is where we would find ch coronation chicken usually today. So maybe it has changed really beyond what is expected of it from the 1950s. I don't know, I'm just wittering now. Basically, it's okay. I wouldn't go out of my way to make this again, but if you imagine a big street party and platters of this laid out with the accompanying rice salad, um, the sauce, everybody getting very excited about it, this is the dish created for the new queen, it would be absolutely fine. There's nothing inherently offensive about it. It's gonna please most palates. It's just not what I was expecting and it isn't that similar to coronation chicken today. Never mind, let's see what dessert is like. To make American upside down cake, you will need 225 ml or eight fluid ounces of milk, 150 grams or five ounces of sugar, three tablespoons of brown sugar, 250 grams or nine ounces of plain flour, a pinch of salt, cream to serve, a can of pineapple rings, 50 grams or two ounces of butter plus an extra three tablespoons, four level teaspoons of baking powder, soaked dried apricots, one egg, one or two plums, glacé cherries. Cream the brown sugar with three tablespoons of butter. Line the bottom and sides of a cake tin with the mixture, then chop the plums and lay the fruit along the bottom and sides as you please. Cream the sugar and remaining butter together until fluffy and pale. Add the egg and beat it in. Sift in the flour, baking powder and salt and add the milk gradually, whisking all the time. Gently pour over the fruit lined tin and place into an oven heated to 180 degrees C, 350F or gas mark 4. Bake it for about an hour. 
When it's cooked, turn it out while hot and serve. Okay, so we come to dessert, the ultimate in kind of American dining, come to Britain, or like Britain high society, American upside down cake. Now, interestingly, the recipe said that this could be made with canned peaches or canned pineapples. So, although we are now familiar with upside down pineapple cake, it seems that originally, when it first made its way to Britain, it was kind of neck and neck between the two and wasn't clear which type of canned fruit would win out. Anyway, let's see. That's really nice. That's not very sweet at all compared to modern day cakes, but still it's quite, it's quite buttery. Um, and the sweetness really comes from the fruit and from that kind of brown sugar glaze that's uh, on top, but not very sweet and surprisingly light and fluffy, um, considering that it was made with plain flour rather than obviously self-raising flour. Um, so I guess you really do need to make sure that you add in all of the baking powder or bicarb or whatever it was that I used um, so that it rises properly because it's, it's actually got a really quite a good rise on it. So that's, that's very nice. Now, she says that you can serve this warm with the sauce and then it will become more like a pudding as a third course, or you can let it cool and then serve it on its own as a cake. So I've cheated a little bit because I've let this cool and then I've eaten it. So technically this wouldn't be served as a dessert after, you know, a dinner, but never mind. It's actually very, very lovely. And if you like a cake that's not too sweet, definitely recommend making this version of pineapple upside down cake. So that's all from me today. Hope that you've enjoyed the 1950s. Join me next time when I'll be donning my beehive, maybe some sort of hippie tie-dye dress, whatever I can find, uh, and dining on the 1960s. Thank you very much for watching and join me again next time. When my husband and I got married, he bought me a book a reproduction of a 50s guide to housewives of how to make their homes a pleasant and loving place for their husbands. And I'm going to share with you some of the advice now. When your husband returns home from work, have dinner ready. Plan ahead, even the night before, to have a delicious meal on time. This is a way of letting him know that you've been thinking about him and are concerned about his needs. Most men are hungry when they come home and the prospects of a good meal are part of the warm welcome needed. Prepare the children. Take a few minutes to wash the children's hands and faces if they are small, comb their hair if necessary, change their clothes. They are little treasures and he would like to see them playing the part. Clear away the clutter. Make one last trip through the house part of your journey before your husband returns home, gathering up school books, toys, papers, etc. Then run a dust cloth over the tables. Your husband will feel he has reached a haven of rest and order, and it will give you a lift too. The goal is to make your home a place of peace and order where your husband can renew himself in body and spirit.